so easy. I can't see how you can f it up. Your, your two brothers who both have PhDs, what do you guys disagree the, the most vehemently on? Well, it doesn't matter because I've got two PhDs. <laughs> there you go. We disagree on the need to have... <laughs> My name is Yul. I'm here for episode two of our Kendo Enlightened Discourse Talks, or KED Talks. Uh, I'm here today with Drs. Blake and Alex Bennett. Uh, Blake is a lecturer at the Bachelor of Sports, Health, and Physical Education degree in the School of Curriculum and Pedagogy at the University of Auckland. Uh, he has a PhD in sports coaching with a focus on uh, on pedagogies in, in rugby coaches in New Zealand and Japanese secondary school. And his current research uh, is on the online pedagogies in, uh, in sports coaching. So he's a, been a coach and a volunteer for over 20 years uh, and uh, also coach of the New Zealand men's kendo team. I'm also here with uh, Dr. Alex Bennett, uh, who is a professor at the Kansai University in Osaka. Uh, among his many accomplishments are, are like uh, kendo culture in the sword and his most recent one, uh, Bushido Explained. So we're here to sort of just talk a, a little bit about uh, whatever comes to mind, but ostensibly we're, we're here to talk about... My book? <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about the book. <laughs> um, but ostensibly we're here to talk about sort of the, the differences in, in teaching styles between uh, in, in Japan and... and uh, the outside and the rest of the world. So um, what do you guys think is the, some of the biggest differences between uh, the way kendo is taught uh, in Japan and the way it's taught uh, outside Japan? Uh, yeah, it's a really, thanks Yulan. It's a really good question. Uh, and it, it's so big and broad in many ways because there's, you know, it's not just uh, a comparison between Japan and the rest of the world, each of the different countries, uh, federations and dojo within there, I imagine, have their own unique sort of uh, perspectives on things, how they're supposed to be done, how they're supposed so, to be delivered. But I mean, if this, if this were like a spectrum, right, with, uh, with say Japan on this end and say the most off out there country there, like would you say like it's a, they're pretty evenly distributed on the spectrum or is it like Japan and then the rest of the world over, over here? I, I think, yeah, it, it, and it's probably a, a good entry point to, to sort of explore. I think given the nature of what we do with, with Kendo and, 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 and its origins, where it comes from, where it, you know, sort of uh, developed and, and how we all became exposed to it, you know, a lot of the pedagogy or the way we instruct uh, and the values that we champion in those sorts of environments are quite closely linked, at least in my observation, to the way that... Um, things tend to be done in Japan, right? Um, again, sort of going on your, your continuum uh, example, if you were looking at teach or teaching or coaching, uh, really, really sort of simply, you could say the coach-led approaches and the athlete-led approaches. So to put that in a, in a little bit more kendo-specific uh, terminology, I guess you got, you know, sen what sensei says goes, we do everything that sensei or senpai says, and then your students and the members just sort of um, uh, follow the lead. Whereas opposite to that would be the students and leaders start to make their own decisions about what we're going to focus on today or, you know, what, what our values are or, you know, how we do kirikaishi or whatever that case may be, right? So you've got this, the coach leading the way, the sensei leading the way, or the athletes making the decision. So if we were to look at coaching like that, I tend to think, you know, my observations is that in the kendo world, we, we, we tend to see that coach-led, that sensor-led uh, sort of thing. And I don't think that that varies across uh, countries at the, at the moment, especially in, in Kendo context. You've got to look at all, also at the, uh, the context as well. And first of all, if you're going to compare Japan with the rest of the world, um, apart from a few countries that come to mind, like Korea and uh, um, you know, a few other uh, countries in Europe, perhaps. Um, the, the makeup of, of the people who practice kendo is completely different. So in Japan, you've got a very large population which enables 
children to practice with children, uh, junior high school kids to practice with junior high school kids, high school kids from high school, uh, high school clubs, uh, university students at the collegiate level, um, and then the shakaijin or the, the, um, uh, the workforce. You also have who are essentially professionals, the police, um, and, and so on and so forth. So you've got this, all of these different groups that are generally, often they will have completely, a completely different focus. So what the kids would be doing and what the university students are doing and what the police are doing is gonna be different because their, their motivations, their objectives are different. Whereas generally speaking, uh, any dojo or any club that you're going to visit outside of Japan, it's going to be a mixture of everybody. So you're going to have kids, uh, you're going to have teenagers, uh, you're going to have men, women of all ages, of all levels, practicing together. And so with that point alone, uh, you know, the, obviously the, the, the way in which kendo is going to be taught is going to be is going to be different um quite often outside of japan you've got to keep everybody happy somehow otherwise people are not going to do kendo because it's just so abstract you know and so different to uh mainstream sports whatever they might be or even mainstream martial arts whatever they might be the other uh thing sort of touch on what blake was talking about about the teaching styles whether it's a coach led or athlete led I can say that in Japan recently, it's kind of changing, um, but it's a lot slower to change because Kendo, um, one of its wonderful characteristics is there is no retirement. Okay, you do Kendo until you drop dead in the dojo. And, you know- Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> it's a dream. It's not like it already. Um, <laughs> you're in your 60s and your 70s and your 80s and you, it's something you continue throughout your life and that means it's not just looking on the outside in these older people older senseis or senpais are actually in and so it's it's very hard for uh for a, a martial art or an art or a discipline like kendo to bring in the latest uh innovations and perhaps coaching techniques or sports science um because basically uh, the old guard is always there and you know they, um, they can be quite stubborn uh, what worked for us should work for you you young whippersnappers right and up until now most of the kendo instruction outside of japan uh, has been led by japanese people or led by people who have been led by japanese people and so you have uh, this kind of framework that is very Japan centric, apart from, you know, there are differences like you'd have a, a kind of more of a Korean model, which has made a lot of inroads overseas and, and so forth. But that is also changing now. Uh, I think it's not a massive change yet, but there are a growing number of uh, homegrown kendo coaches who are really adapting uh, certain methodologies in kendo to suit their their, co their, their cultural uh, setting. And to give you an example, uh, every year I get um, invited to go to Croatia, uh, the Iadera Gashku, which we have in um, uh, June or, or July every year. And I've been going there for a few years now, and I was absolutely gobsmacked the first year that I went. There was about 120 people there. Um, there wasn't a single Japanese instructor at all. Um, I was the instructor and I also had a number of uh, people in, uh, helping me instruct. They're all homegrown Italian or Brits or, um, you know, Europeans. No Japanese sense. It's the first time I've ever been to a kendo training camp that hasn't been led by a Japanese person. So things are certainly changing and especially in Europe, I think is leading the way in that respect. Um, although, uh, you know, it's been, you can see that around the place more now than ever before. So I think things are starting to change. Do you think that, the, I guess, the, the, the youth or the youthfulness of, of the sensei makes a bigger difference than uh, foreigner versus non, or the, the Japanese versus non-Japanese, that way? Mm, what do you think, Blake? 
Like I feel that the point that, that you made, Alex, before about the, the old guard, um, mindful of, of ageist terminology there, um, <laughs> yeah, in universities, we have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, that's a really, it's a really good point, and it's absolutely true. I don't think anyone would, um, you, you, we, could, we could all look at our own, uh, you know, national context and see something like that. But bec because of, you know, the nature of that being, uh, as it is, there's that constant evolution, you know what I mean? And so that old guard is constantly sort of evolving and, you know, new perspectives become the old guard, if that makes sense, right? And so especially, uh, you know, Alex's ob observations in, in places like Croatia and other parts of Europe, there's enough of a history, uh, a kind of history in those countries that they can start to stand on, on, on their own, own two feet. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. It's, it's an evolution of perspectives that was established in a, a you know, um, from a relationship with a Japanese sensei or a club or something like that. But it's evolved to now to be at a point where, okay, let's, let's bring in some stuff that, that is a little bit more culturally relevant to the members that we're teaching or the people that are leading us into the future. Mindful too, that what we're doing is a very, traditional Japanese uh, art or, or, you know, um, uh, so you something kind of interesting, which is uh, sort of the old, the, 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 the old guard, you know, we, we tend to think of it as a hide bound sort of never changing thing, but you know, as, as new people age into the old guard and, and the old guard dies off, uh, it does change. I mean, you guys have been doing kendo for 20, 30 years now. I mean, how has the old guard, changed in those in those 20 years which old guard are you talking about because the old guard in japan hasn't changed at all <laughs> <laughs> they pe uh, perpetuate the same old same old mate although um so it's, so it's entry into the uh the hachidan sort of club predicated a bit on your uh, ability to, to mimic the uh the old guard thinking uh well, that's, I, I can tell you that if I ever get initiated into the Hachidan Club. <laughs> um, but certainly uh, there is a game that you have to play. Not, I don't mean politics, but I mean the way that you do your kendo. And um, you've got to fit the mold. Um, you've got to be able to, you know, perform the way that they would expect you to perform to become something like Hachidan. But uh, just leaving that aside, um, one thing... I can say one of the biggest changes I've noticed in the time that I've lived in Japan and, you know, I've been, I first came here in 1987 and I started kendo at high school. Uh, and I can tell you right now, and it, it's not supposed to be an old war story or anything like that, but the kind of stuff that we did at high school level kendo, the kind of beatings that we did every day, um, you know, to the extent that, it, it, you know, it was when I think thinking back on it now, I thought of it as sadistic at, at the time, but I, I think it's even more sadistic now. Um, when, I, when I think back on the kind of things that we, we had to do and the kind of treatment that we received. Well, it was sadistic, it's, but acceptable. And, and nowadays it's just plain statistic, sadistic and, and no longer. It's not acceptable not at all. In fact, uh, there's been a number of reasons why this has changed. I think that the nature of young people in Japan has changed. Um, I noticed this at university, but um, uh, the students these days are very Western in their approach sometimes. They don't, they, they, they will do the hard yards of the, you know, without bitching and moaning about it. But these days more than ever, um, <clears throat> you have to motivate them in a different way. You have to give them a reason why uh, something doing it this way is going to be beneficial for them. Um, it's harder in Japan to try and get students to lead themselves and use initiative and training like Blake's talking about athlete, uh, athlete, uh, led sort of training sessions. If you were to sort of like let students do that, they would be floundering over here for a while. Okay. Um, it's because they've never really been thought, uh, taught to think like that. That's, that's the issue. Uh, you know, the, the Japanese school system is very much about uh, teaching kids to toe the line. 
But these days I notice that the Japanese students are very similar to the Western students I come into contact with. They've, they, they need to know a reason why they should be doing something. And once they're happy with that, then they'll, they'll go ahead and do it. Um, whereas, you know, the old days of beating the crap out of somebody and saying, well, you just got to grin and bear it and eventually you'll get it type approach, which is pretty much where I came from, um, just doesn't work here anymore. In fact, it's, it's not considered socially se acceptable anymore. That kind of hazing that used to be commonplace is getting rarer and rarer. And um, I mean, part of the reason is, is society has changed. It's evolved. A uh, new generation of kids have been brought up in, a, in an era, you know, of the, of the digital native, essentially. So their values are probably different. You've got things like smartphones where zealous parents will be taking videos and, and releasing them to the media when their kids are getting beaten up and everybody's like, oh my God, oh my God, this is terrible. This is not what we want. So, you know, the context gets missing. And so teachers in Japan now are really, you know, the old ways of you are not allowed to drink in the dojo. You've got to do two hours of training in summer and you've got to grin and bear it. Otherwise you want to get, give it, never get strong. That, all these kind of old myths about what was needed to uh, make you mentally and physically stronger are gradually sort of disappearing in Japan. And in that sense, I see a lot of similarities now coming out, not so much in the way that people are teaching still in Japan, although that is changing, but uh, the way in which kids really want to learn. Um, when I say kids, I'm talking about university levels, they're the ones I deal with. Um, there's a lot more similarities now between these younger generations, irrespective of the culture that they come from than there ever has been before. Have you noticed that, Blake? Yeah, it's you're absolutely right, mate. Like, there's, there's a couple of things that you've brought up that that I'm just sort of sitting here nodding because um, based on you know my own experience in training in Japan, but also the research that I'm doing. So the first thing that that it, pops it, it just lines up almost perfectly with your research, right? Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, and, and interesting enough, it's not kendo specific research in, uh, on this particular topic. So. If I can be a little bit more clear, when I had the privilege of, of training in Japan doing my master's at the uh, the University of, uh, Osaka University of Health, oh God, what was it, Univers Osaka University of Health and Sports Science. Sports Science, that's right. It was Osaka yeah. Therapy, that's what we... Uh, that's what Did we you really get your master's there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for the diploma to come in the, in the, uh, in the mail, so maybe not. Um, but that, it, at that time, my, my thesis was about, uh, broadly speaking, the differences between uh, strict and harsh keiko, or ways of doing keiko, uh, versus, um, admittedly, Western definitions of violence and bullying and hazing. Um, and, you know, retros in retrospect, it's probably better suited as a... As a um, a PhD thesis or, or more because it's such a massive, massive topic. But, you know, as Alex has, has said and, and observed uh, himself, like there's a transition happening in those old practices to new ways. And one of the things that, um, one of the examples that I can share uh, is in the summer gashuku that, that we used to do, or that the, the, the students used to do and that I was a part of, uh, the sensei, I remember one day, sat us down at the start of the, uh, of the gashiko on the first morning and explained to us uh, the menu, what we were going to be doing for the next three days. Uh, and he was careful to point out when we were going to have drinks breaks, when we were going to have lunch, and when we were going to rest and all the rest of it. And I remember sort of looking around and everybody was absolutely stunned that we, <laughs> we were privy to this information. <laughs> <laughs> particularly that there was that there was water breaks like what's going on and since they're getting soft what's the story here um but he he was he's a you know he was a really astute man he realized and recognized that there's a huge uh, shift going on outside of the kendo bu, the kendo context and in the other bukats or the other extracurricular sports clubs in the university uh that are a little bit more early adopters of sports science and nutrition and psychology and those sorts of things. Uh, and just looking at that shift, that transition of those clubs, I think the sensei and his role realized that 
uh, perhaps if we keep flogging this horse, we're going to we're going to be at odds with what the expectations are of parents, of the wider faculty, the university, uh, and as Alex pointed out, you're just going to kill someone straight up. I mean, yeah, the, the danger is always there, and it, and it always will be. I mean, we we don't. This isn't a tickle fight, you know. Like it, there's there's um, it's hard yakka, and it's supposed to be right. Uh, but within that, you know, the coach has a responsibility, whether, you know, whatever sport or art it might be, that, you know, your job is to facilitate learning uh, with the people that you've got and in a safe environment. And, and while, you know, Alex, um, as my older brother, brought his experiences back from his high school days and, uh, you know, replicated that as you would you replicate that 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 approach and that was my kendo upbringing and we had Masahiro Imafuji as part of it and that it all contributed so within that you know it's easy to sort of um replicate those those ideas and I appreciate the the, the importance of training really hard one of the things that Alex and, and Hiro used to scream at me was nana koro biyaoki and this is while they were forcing their knee into my temple as I was lying on the... <laughs> well, so this uh, fall, fall down seven, get up eight, right? Correct. That's get, exactly right. Get, and so that, you know, get back up again. Exactly. And so that was the, that was the sort of the underpinning philosophy, I guess. I'm not speaking for Alec or Hill, but that was, that was, those were the messages that I picked up. So while I advocate, you know, those are really important uh, ideas and philosophies to get across the, pedagogy, the, the way in which that's delivered, needs to evolve with the people that you're dealing with, right? And I think going back to the topic at hand, the, the fact that the sensei uh, in the kendo world um, start to recognize that, it's, it is, as Alex said, it's a really recent thing, but it is a noticeable thing that's happening as well. If I, I can add- just to be at the, uh, at like the, the, the school level, I remember I was reading an article years back on, I think, uh, Mike Scoss's, uh, the Scoss's Koryu.com. It was an interview with a kendo sensei, I think, and they were talking about some 24-hour uh, keiko that they did, oh. right? So just basically non-24, it was like 24-hour non-stop yeah. uh, keiko. Yeah. And, uh, and the guy was talking about, you know, at the end of it, like he's talking about, it was sort of, to, for him, it, he, he put it as sort of a, like this sort of transcendental experience, like after a certain point of exhaustion, like, uh, you know, he stopped thinking and he just lived in the moment and, and all of that. Um, but then also noted that, you know, like he pissed blood for a week or something afterwards because of the, uh, the amount of, of stress that his body had, had undergone. Um, anyway, and, and, and the tone of the article is, I think, interesting. I mean, it's, it's been a year since I've read it, but uh, from what I recall, it was sort of like a little bit like, this is bad. I don't think anyone should do this anymore nowadays. But at the same time, the guy seemed to be like a little bit wistful, like this to me was such a formative experience in my, uh, in my kendo. And it really helped sort of shape me and, and gave me a sense of, 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 of who I am as a person. And what my kendo should be like. Yeah, well, that's pretty much why I um, got hooked on kendo for that same kind of transcendental experience, um, where I just got the crap beaten out of me so badly, but somehow, for some reason, I don't know, just keep getting up and keep doing it. And by the time it's finished, it's like, geez, what the hell just happened? Well, you know? I mean, there, there's maybe parallels to be drawn with uh, an abusive relationship, right? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> because you love you, sort yeah. of. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why it's a very complicated issue. And that was sort of like what uh, Blake would did in his thesis at, uh, when he was in Osaka. It's like, where is that line between, uh, when Japanese it was kitai, okay, by sort of forging somebody or uh, basically um, bullying somebody, okay? Um, and from memory, Blake, I think you're, uh, one of your many conclusions was it's really about intent, isn't it? Yeah, it, 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 essentially it is. And, and the intent is a really big part of it. When you start to sort of break the, the, um, the experience down, you go, yeah, well, I guess that makes sense. But a really important part that I found was also the perception 
you know, the way in which the uh, the receiver, the the core high, or the you know the person, the victim, the, victim, <laughs> yeah, the survivor is the correct terminology, and um, at the moment um, is you know it depends on how they perceive that that uh, that behaviour, that action, that kek or ho, uh, or, or whatever that experience, and you know in the context where I was studying, which was the university, uh, you know reasonably high level university kendo club they had over over the years built it up and it's reinforced with the the old boys and the old girls that come back and the type of uh conversations and speeches that they give at the nomi kai at the, at the parties and all that sort of stuff that we we survive this we thrive in this and therefore um this is how we do it you know and it, and it's sort of that perception becomes ingrained and it becomes part of the thing and so it's very easy now in that context to push a little bit past today a past forging and really start to be blatantly yeah, yeah o- over the top and yet it, it continues but you know um without going into too much detail because it's not really my place that it the wheels did come off from time to time um you know where where it was just too much, and that person decided, "Hey, I this is not for me anymore." You know what I mean? And so, so what's your guys' advice for for, I guess from both sides, um, for coaches or instructors on how to toe that line, what they should be looking for, or from a, a student's perspective, like where where and how do you say this is no longer forging? This is this is bullying, like. Thanks What's up from the, 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 the student side? Because I, I <laughs> probably most people listening to this are going to be from from the student yeah. side. Like, what's what well, should I, think, I as a student be looking out for, uh, or yeah. or do if if I encounter that? Yeah, I think just going back a couple of conversations to to, to pick out a certain comment that was made to really make this point. Alex said that the way in which <clears throat> students uh, approach their their kindle or their learning is that they need to know why, why are we doing this? You know, what is the purpose of, of you know, this kakarigeko or this soji or, you know, why do I have to fold my hakama after every training or whatever it might be, right? So understanding uh, that the needs or the expectations that young learners have, whether they be Japanese or other, um, they're going to evolve, they're changing. And we as coaches or sensei or senpai I think it's really important to break open and understand what those expectations are. And now that is a really, that's a real departure, I think, at least from my observations, on what that joge kanke, that hierarchical uh, relationship that we celebrate in the dojo, what that allows. You know, it's really hard, I, my observations for a first year student at the university to question. Uh, or ask why of a fourth year, let alone an old boy or a sensei, uh, unless it's unless they're applied with with bows. But you know, so you know that hierarchical structure that we celebrate both in Japan and outside of Japan in the dojo sometimes blocks our ability to communicate and say, "Hey, why are you here? What can I provide to you in your Kindle journey? How can I make this experience better for you?" I mean, and, a lot of times, like the the the, the most torturous part it's just extreme physical activity right like it's, it's just i mean the, the 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 rationale is simple we want to build your stamina we want to build your uh, yes but yeah 100 percent you know but does the student does the student know that do they understand that and so that dialogue i think needs to be as we progress and as we understand that young learners or new you know 20 21st century learners have different expectations and different needs we have to be comfortable with having that transparency and that dialogue to say, hey, this is what I'm, this is my philosophy or this is my approach. This is why I'm doing this. How do you feel about it? And I know that that sounds really new age and all the rest of it, but, and it's a little bit scary for the old guard, as we were talking about before, to sort of have that transparency, but it would certainly be my approach based on uh, the, the research that I'm doing at the moment uh, about, you know, the defensive what we call the defensive pedagogies or the defensive way in which coaches are now reacting to this wider sort of societal 
uh, cotton wool model, model coddling of, of young people. You know, oh, it's all new things, oh, it's rubbish. It's really important, regardless of what you think and what you went through, to say, hey, look, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. What do you think? You know, what do you need from me? Because it's a new relationship, because it's evolving. And that, I think, is the first step to navigating, uh, bringing in those old approaches or, or maintaining those old approaches with a new set of assumptions from new learners. Does that kind of make sense? Like it's about sort of opening up the conversation and, and providing that why, providing that rationale and understanding it from both sides of the shinai. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I would um, add to that. Uh, the fact that kendo compared to, you know, when I was at high school and how it's changed so much in Japan now, or it's, uh, if, you, if you were to criticize it, you could say everybody's getting soft compared to, you know, in my day when we were, we were hard. There's very much a veteran mentality in, in kendo. Uh, that's what the, the old guard has and that's what the, the new guys inherit. Um, but, you know, we, 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 the level that I'm training at in Japan with university students, the, the students are obviously very high level, uh, very skilled athletes. Um, they're, you know, basically Shi'ai machines. Their focus is, is very narrow. Uh, they're doing kendo not because they want to be better human beings or anything like that. They're doing kendo because they want to go out there and win. Um, and that's fine. That's, that's the level. That's what they need to focus on now so they can go to the next level and the next level and the next level after that. It's, it's, a, it's a process, right? You know, I'll be training with these, these kids every day. Some of the kids I'll give a real hard time to um, because I'll know the kid's slacking off. You know, and I'm over twice their age and I'm moving more than they are sort of thing. You know, there's something wrong. Okay, so I'll sort of rile them up a little bit. Um, I'll put a fire up their ass, basically, you know. But I have to be very careful with that. And the reason I can do it is because I've had it done to me. Okay, and I've had it done to me with love. Okay. And so I am constantly looking at who it is that I'm fighting. And eventually what happens, if you, if you do kendo, you know this, you'll be fighting some sense. And before you know it, for some reason, suddenly you just, you, you've completely lost control and you just give in and you end up just going crazy and trying to do karate geko until the sensei says stop. It, you, you don't know why, it just happens. You know, and that's because the other person, the sense has been controlling you and sort of pushing you and then frustrating you. And in the end, you just, there's nothing you can do and you just, you go berserk. That's how it works, right? And, and so the same, I'm in a position now, I get that done to me by some of these old senses and I've had it done to me right from the start. And now I'm in a position through my experience and my level or skill level of kendo where, it, where I'm able to uh, assert that kind of control on the students that I'm fighting. And like I said, some of them who are clearly slacking off, they have objectives. If they want to meet those objectives, whatever they are, every kid's going to be different, but especially the, uh, the team members, then it requires a little bit more uh, determination perhaps, or a little bit more uh, um, letting go at certain times a little bit more confidence in themselves or whatever. So I'll be looking at all of these things as, I, as I'm fighting them. And then it's, it just happens naturally most of the time. Sometimes it gets really heated. And then sometimes you just go nuts and they go nuts and blah, 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 blah. But you've got to know when to stop. How do you, so how do you know when to stop though? Like what, what, what are some of the signs that you look at? Um, there's no one thing, of course, but... You, what, what do you look at? You look at, seriously, and that, this is really hard because you are doing it too. The thing is, it's, for, 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 from an outside perspective, it looks like some person's just bullying another kid. But I can tell you that I'm working just as hard as, as the person who's doing the attacking. It's like Sakudo sensei said to us once, Blake, remember, it's like, as Motodachi, your role is to... Uh, basically be cut to pieces for the benefit of the kakarite, okay? You're going to take it all and you give it back. You give as good 
as you get and vice versa. It's, it's, it is a two-way thing, even though it doesn't look like it. Um, how do I know? It's a feeling, and it's a feeling that it's not very scientific, actually, but it's a feeling because I've been through it. There are certain students that I would never do it to, or I, I would never engage in that relationship with, because I don't think that we're on the same wavelength. Okay, but there are certain students that I would. And that's because we have a connection already and we understand each other and we know that's what's going to happen and we're, and we're, we're prepared to uh, sacrifice ourselves for that, for that moment. So it's part of that superior powers of discernment, I guess they're looking for uh, in, in Renshi Kyoshi. You've got, it's got to be based on trust. And there will be students who won't want to do that. And I'm not going to make them do it. In the old days, you would. Okay. But now you yeah. pick and choose. And yeah. not only that, um, but I always, you know, um, we'll finish with a nice hug and fucking good on you, man. That was bloody awesome. And really make them feel proud of themselves. In the old days, you'd never do that. It's like, what yeah, the hell? It may be a nod, like a, a grim nod. And that'd be like the equivalent of a, of a war hug. <laughs> <laughs> or a grumble. So my point is that, you know, I would still do it because I think that kind of intensity is really important. Okay. If you, depending on what it is that you want to achieve in your kendo. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really important, but you really, really have to be so careful because in, in the thick of it all, anything can happen. Emotions, let, you let go of your emotions and then suddenly if you, you lose control, then you know, hell can break loose and it can be really dangerous. And so I'm always really afraid of it. But having said that, yeah, Blake? Oh, no, sorry, Alex, you, you continue, man. No, go for it, man. Oh, I was just gonna um, draw on something that you said there, I think that ties the two the two ideas, the one that I presented before and, and what you've talked about, you said trust and I, and the tip of my tongue was relationship. And, you know, Alex suggest suggestion that with certain people in the, in the dojo, there's an expectation or there's a, there's an understanding, Hey, this, this is going to get, um, this is going to get physical, but we, we're on the same page and that's based on relationship. That's based on trust. Right. Um, and there's those that you just don't because it's probably better for everybody concerned if you just sort of leave and go, okay, mate, that's cool. Well, um, you know, have a good day. Good luck in your classes. Who you later? Yeah. Um, but, you know, as it, as it relates to a community club, uh, like outside of Japan, where we don't necessarily have that, um, uh, you know, certain expectations at certain year groups and that sort of stuff, by and large, what we can achieve outside of that hierarchical context is that relationship. And going back to my point before about having those conversations, why is this important? Why are we doing this? You know, what, what sort of things do I want to see from you next time? Or after doing that kakari geko, what did you feel about yourself? You know, you, you know the, the pride and of, of achieving that and everybody in the club giving you a round of applause because, you know, since they really gave it to you today sort of thing. But that rapport, that relationship that you develop is, is you know, a really, really key part of that, uh, of that question. And, and, you know, you, I understand we're sort of looking for tangible, quantifiable signs to stop mm. a moment. But I think rather than looking for that just at the moment, where do we start? We start with developing that relationship with teaching or coaching or being a senpai to people. You know, there's a person in front of us, right? And they have their, their, their feelings and emotions. And we want them to feel that the nasty, <laughs> outwardly nasty physical uh, kakari geko session is something that's going to contribute to their development, whether it be their technical development or their spiritual or their mental, or however you want to, uh, you know, frame it up. It depend. it really relies, I think, as Alec was saying, on that trust that you build with them. How do you build that trust? Talk to them. Understand what this the purpose of this exchange is right and then we can start to read the cues uh there's a there's a sign there there's a tear forming or the smile's gone you know i can see the twinkle in their eye isn't quite there i need to wrap this up and give them a good pat on the back well done 
good on you, you know? Uh, and I, I think there's a really important thing that we miss if we don't, if we don't embrace this, this changing, this evolution. If we stick with the, I'm the sensei and I know best, do as I say, it's just outdated, antiquated, and, and it's going to lead, uh, at best, it'll lead to people resenting the trainings and not coming. And we really need to build that rapport, I think, because we can't fall back on the hierarchy as much, perhaps, as a university club or, or otherwise, right? Okay. I mean, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, we are just about out of time, but uh, this has been a really interesting conversation. I think there's a lot more we could we could dig down into, uh, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do so at some other date. But I want to thank you both for, for your time and, uh, and for, for contributing, as always. Thanks, Thanks Julian. Thanks, Blake. It's good to see you again.